Hey everyone, um, Sleepy Reader here, and uh, this is my first uh, comic book thoughts video in quite a while. I think I'm going to talk about some comics that delighted me, and then some comics that interested me or intrigued me. Um, and I may, I may end at the very end talking about um, a little bit about Blubber which is not safe for work, not safe probably just with kids around or other people who might be sensitive to uh, s some sexual issues, I guess. Some pretty yucky ones in a, way, in a sense. Okay, so <laughs> having said that, you can skip to the end and hear me talk about that if I end up doing that. Um, comics that delighted me um, this week I think it was this week, I just read BPRD Hell on Earth uh, 141, art by Mike Norton. Intriguingly, the story is by Mike Mignola, Cameron Stewart, and Chris Robertson. Um, so that's quite a cast of characters doing the story, you might say. Different, nor most of Hell, um, Hell on Earth has been Mike Mignola and John Arcudi. Um, John Arcudi is gone now, and so he's gathered more people. Mignola has gathered more people to help him with the plot. I I think technically, I mean, maybe this ties in somehow, but this seems the this seems to be just a three issue story plunked down in the middle of Hell on Earth, but not really having to do with Hell on Earth. It's more of a ghost story, and it's a really well done, interesting, fun ghost story. Um, with this female character whose name I don't remember. I don't know if they mentioned her name at all in this issue, so I, maybe in the last issue they did, I'd have to go dig up that issue and find out. Again, my lack of knowledge in BPRD, having only read 18 or 19 issues, <laughs> means that I, I often miss things like the names of characters. Um, but this character is very cool. She has some kind of power to use sort of religious magic to get on the astral plane, so to speak, and talk to demons and ghosts. And um, so this issue has kind of a haunted house, and we find out what it's all about. And it seems like, you know, in a way, this issue could be a one and done, except it seems like at the end, there's something more. She thought she'd gotten rid of the, the ghost, and, and, and now there's something more that she has to deal with. So that's going to be fun. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a f simple, fun ghost story, really, um, that was very well done. You don't really see ghost stories that much. Um, their limbo ended, and uh, this my enjoyment of this series has grown. I think the first issue or two, I um, wasn't sure whether I liked it or not, and then I really liked it. By the end, I'm still left with questions. Maybe if I were to reread all nine issues, I could piece together exactly where this city of Dedond, I think it's called, which is obviously a kind of limbo. Um, what it's supposed to be, it clearly relates heavily to voodoo and some idea of voodoo that, that involves modern technology or really kind of... 80s VCR technology and cassette tapes and stuff. Um, I've really come to love the art and just really intrigued by this world. So I'm I'm hoping that there will be like a further mini series uh, set in this, or if not, I hope to just see this creative team do some other work. Um, so I was pretty satisfied by the end, but I like I like I'm indicating I kind of had some questions. But overall, the series kind of delighted me. The, the art, which really grew on me, delighted me. And, um, you know, even though it, it had some elements that are familiar somehow, the, the mix of it made it feel like quite a unique book slash reading experience. Um, unique, <laughs> completely different way. I continued, I get more and more delighted by uh, Neil Adams' writing and drawing Coming of Superman. The first issue, he had a co-writer who kind of cleaned up his dialogue. Since then, he's been all on his own. Who knows what, you know, the back drop of that is. But a lot of his dialogue seems to be 
inadvertently hilarious. Um, and of course, I uh, like here's Superman punching a villain, and he's saying, "Nothing requires you. You make our existence ugly with your presence. Give me the boy, or your life is forfeit." It's just such odd dialogue that I kind of find it delightful, and I, I find at times I really, really dig the Neil Adams artwork. He still has it on some pages. He still has that old magic, and then other times he doesn't. Um, but maybe he, you know, he may have gained some things and lost some things over the years in terms of how he does comics, but it's, it's still kind of a visual pleasure for me. And um, just a bit of that uh, watching a bad cheesy movie kind of experience that I find, you know, in some other book it might not work for me here. You know, it just takes me away. And I, I each issue I actually put at the top of my pile to read because I know I'm just going to kind of have fun. And there are some cool concepts, you know, hidden within. Um, you know, someone else could, it would be great if someone else, you know, took a lot of these ideas and did a different riff on them someday. Um, probably somewhere, you know, I have not, my DC knowledge is spotty and scattered, so there's probably been other times where Luther and Darkseid teamed up. Um, and so anyway, it's it's a fun book for me. I think that that's kind of, this is kind of a buyer beware. For a lot of people, they won't get into it. Um, maybe similar is uh, the Swamp Thing. Um, the Swamp Thing has a special delight, in my opinion, of, um, of seeing Kelly Jones, the artist, at some kind of new peak and just doing a fantastic artwork with uh, DC's... Um, magical characters they're, they're supernatural characters we get and in issue five we get a lot of them uh the swamp the swamp thing obviously uh we get dead man we get um phantom stranger There's someone else in here we get to go to nanda parat the mystical city in the himalayas um we get the specter um all of them kind of the, the, as we've dis, many people have discussed, this is written by Len Wein as if it's still 1971. And so a lot of these characters' appearances seem forced, like just because we want the special appearance of these guests in the comic. But for me, there's a certain goofy panaz, so it kind of goes along with that Superman book, although it's not nearly as bad writing but it is another kind of bad writing i suppose or 70s writing uh which depending on your taste is good or bad to me it's a lot of fun and it's it's not as slodgy as some of the really bad overwriting that people used to do but it's kind of gleefully overwritten in certain ways um so he uses a lot of captions and the captions are not people's thoughts the, the, they're the old-fashioned captions. They're the narrator talking to you. And this one, you know, it starts, What's wrong with this picture? Is the unfettered tangle of roots and branches that have rendered the heart of this sleepy little hamlet uninhabitable? Oh, sorry, I didn't even read that so well. Is it the unfettered tangle of roots? Is it the two help, hapless figures enveloped in vines who struggle in vain to set themselves free? Or is it the great grotesque bog behemoth who rants from his self-generating throne of thorns to the terrified populace below? I think there's such a knowing fun to that. He's not taking the Swamp Thing seriously, really. Um, it's almost like the a narrator in like Batman 66 or something like that. You know, uh, stay tuned next bat. You know, will Batman survive? It just, I'm not doing that very well. Um, it's just, in my opinion, a lot of fun. And then on top of that, you get the gorgeous art. Um, this has got one more issue. So I fantasize after this that we'll probably see more Lenween, but even more, I just really hope to see a lot more of 
Kelly Jones artwork in mainstream comics. Speaking of mainstream comics, <laughs> this issue of The Vision, uh, this is in the very sort of alt-indie version of The Vision where he is living in the suburbs with his not quite functional family, <laughs> more than not quite functional, his dysfunctional family of robots that he's created. And this issue with a guest artist um, who I'm not familiar with, but who does a fine job, named Michael Walsh, um, gives us a whole, oops, there's the Luke Cage ad, gives us a whole backstory to, um, to the vision leading up to where, we, where this started. And it, it very neatly hooks it into the whole history of the Avengers and the vision and Wanda Maximoff and their marriage and their children and everything like that so that um, so that this comic that you know is so out there in terms of what a normal Marvel superhero comic should be is suddenly perfectly linked up with all of that and yet still keeps its wonky weird flavor so I really loved this issue um, it surprised me I keep thinking where can he go from here because there's supposed to be 12 issues so now there's um, five issues left and um, I'm just really looking forward to seeing how he's playing with the vision even though I'm a longtime fan of the vision and part of me you know is like oh do they have to mess with the character let's keep him a hero I'm sure he'll be rebooted back into being a real hero and not just a psycho robot <laughs> sometime in the future um, so yeah I I think Lots of people are loving this comic. If you're not getting it, uh, if you're not getting it in single issues, you should definitely get it in trade. It's it's the only Marvel comic that I buy at the comic book shop right now. All the rest, I either wait for the digital, or you know the digital on Marvel Unlimited, or a few others I get in subscription, you know, mailed to me by Marvel. <clears throat> Another delight. Um, was Future Quest. I kind of knew that I would be delighted by it. I bought two copies, one for my daughter to mess up, one for me to save, and the other, the other copy I have somewhere under here um, has the main cover, which I like better. Oh, there it is. And it's a wraparound cover. I hope DC does more wraparound covers. I, along with Along with no ads or less ads in indie comics, I love it when they do wraparound covers like Kaiju Max does. Um, anyway, this has art by Doc Shainer and script by Parker. I don't know how much of the obvious to state. Most people know this is uh, taking the old sort of obscure Hanna-Barbera superhero-ish science fiction-y kind of characters like Johnny Quest and Space Ghost and the Herculoids and Birdman and the Galaxy Trio and mixing them all up together in a little romp. Um, it has colors by Jordi Belair. Um, Doc Shainer does a great, is a great artist for kind of a retro modern, what I call retro modern now, because it's slicker than the real old art or it just has a different quality to it it's still got a modern quality and an old-fashioned quality and and the um this is like a 30-page comic and so some of the art is actually done by the grandfather of retro modern which would be steve rude um <clears throat> anyway the art's a delight in here the story you know i thought i was going to be reading something more like uh dc's previous hanna-barbera comics like um, Scooby-Doo Team-Up, which would have a, uh, a little bit of a knowing wink for the grown-up readers, but then just lots of pure fun for the very young readers. And I'd say a young reader can enjoy this, but not as much as the older reader. It has kind of the slower build-up that, that we're used to in, in modern comics. Um, none of the grim grittiness of modern comics. But uh, but given the material and everything, it's really enjoyable to see them get a slightly more mature um, treatment than they've had in the past. 
and just feel the buildup of this big story. So this issue is just the beginning of a buildup. Um, only a few of the characters are introduced and they're introduced slowly in a sense during these uh, 30 pages compared to a normal kids book. So I'd say this is something you can read with your kids but but I think you might enjoy it more than they do depending on the child. Um, definitely my daughter isn't that interested in them so maybe this sacrificial copy for her was unnecessary but I don't really mind owning two copies. Um, and I didn't pay more for the Bill Sinkovich cover or anything like that. DC doesn't do as many of these high-priced variants, I think, as some companies do. Anyway, so uh, that delighted me. <laughs> it's kind of boring. This delighted me, that delighted me. Uh, Kaiju Max is kind of my most difficult delight because um, this is issue one of season two. You could start here. You could buy the $9.99 trade of season one. I think it's well worth it. Um, this is intended as black comedy and because I just recently listened to some more interviews with, with Xander Cannon, the writer, artist, and colorist of it. And he does say he's going for jokes, but it often it's so dark and bleak, even though it's these cartoony <laughs> giant robots and giant monsters that you can almost read it as not a comedy um but i do want to read it as a comedy and there's something about a very dark black humor when done right that is very appealing to me and it is done right here and i think if it were this dark about real life people it would go towards the bottom of my pile i'd have to save it for when i was in the right mood but um because it is it's a dark, bleak book about these bright and goofy things. It's still not... It's this weird double experience. Um, so it's still kind of a more joyful read, even though it's not a joyful read in a lot of ways. Um, but so if you've been following the Kaiju Max thing, the first season took place almost entirely in on the prison island. It was... A prison movie. Now it's more about people, about monsters on parole and monsters on the run from the law and about the um, law enforcement officers working inside the giant robots um, rather than about the prison guards. I assume that will be most of this second season. So if you, you know, one might have worried that uh, Xander Kennan would overplay the monsters in prison thing for how many, you know, too many issues, too many jokes. But he is varying it up here. Although I'd be happy to go back to the prison and learn a little more about what's going on with people. Like the strange boy that convinces another monster to kill his father. And the, um, the prison doctor who's fallen in love with one of the monsters on a sexual level. <laughs> But for now, we're not going back to those. We do have the continuity of our two of our monsters who escaped from prison and are on the lam. Um, and that kind of introduces us to other things. So Kaiju Max continues to be one of my top, top reads. <clears throat> well, I'm not used to talking so long anymore. When I was at my my new comic book store, I switched comic book stores a few weeks ago, um, and they have dollar bins. But if you're a subscriber to the store, you there are fifty cent bins for you. So I just went through and grabbed a bunch of stuff, and I'd been joking. My daughter had been asking me last weekend. You know, she always wants me to tell her lore of superheroes. And she said, well, what are some of the most obscure superheroes? And I racked my brains. Um, and I came up with the Badger, uh, which was, to me, a pretty obscure superhero created by Mike Barron, who was the writer on Nexus, which is one of my favorite 80s comics. But I never really got into the Badger. Um, he showed up in a few Nexus issues that I read, and 
I didn't get him and I didn't understand. It, it seemed like just an interruption of the Nexus storyline. Um, and I think I read one or two issues back in the early 80s when the Badger first started, but I didn't really get it. Anyway, um, but I'd been talking about it with my daughter and then there in the 50 cent bins were two issues of the Badger. 50 cents, maybe they would be fun to show to my daughter, so I picked them up. Um, and last night I read them. This one was very violent. There's no way I would show it to my daughter. And then I read this one. I don't know whether I'll show it to my daughter or not. But I really loved the Badger. I, it was really delightful. It has artwork that I can't stand. It's very, um, it's very much a kind of 80s artwork where where the artwork got more toned down and was less slick but wasn't very i don't it didn't have a lot of personality it was just lower key than you know what john buscema or someone else would have done in the 70s but it also certain stylistic aspects of it were leading towards stuff they would do in the 90s i mean there's tons of panels but but it's kind of a um there's certain kinds of exagger you can certain kinds of exaggerations that you can see when they could get pushed into 90s style artwork. You can see why the artists in the late 80s that became the superstars of the 90s got a lot of attention because a lot of art got kind of bland. And but and and so the art is really a problem in the Badger because it really doesn't match the um the weird off-kilter humor and absurdity of the Badger. You know, I kind of wish someone like Mike Plug were drawing it, or 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 Will Eisner, or or Michael Allred, or just someone with a a certain wink, wink, nudge, nudge to their artwork, um, who could pull off sort of a mix of the serious and the absurd, um, accent it somewhat. Uh, but, you know, like in this issue, we have the Badger hanging out at um, uh, motorcycle biker bars and riding around on a buffalo and rescuing a, a rhino and um, who belongs in a circus and talking to animals. In this one, he is in an insane asylum and then working for a really rich person who's been alive for 800 years and is being pursued by demons um and and the badger has multiple personalities and one personality is the superhero the badger who may or may not have any superpowers but apparently he can in this issue it seems clear he can actually communicate to animals somehow um but yeah it's just it's a hard to describe book and it 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 has its own weird pacing that i think when i read it you know one or two issues in the early 80s it was to me it was like this is not how a superhero sh book should read and i didn't get that it was i didn't get that it was just um purposefully skewing the whole superhero thing off into a different direction i thought they were just doing the superhero thing badly i think um so now i'm gonna look for more badger books in the bargain bins it's it's just a really fun read for me and i just imagine better art to go with it phew okay well might as well just keep plugging on right so some books that i found interesting but i didn't they didn't delight me i didn't love them and some of them i just got the first issue or whatever and probably won't get the rest um 4001 ad i think this is one of four or one of six and it's the backbone of a um, of a big event, I guess, where you flash to the future of what, what's this like two thousand years in the future of the Valiant Universe. Um, this is a variant cover which I really love, and it has artwork inside that I thought I would love. It just looks really cool as you flip through it, but um, I found on reading it that it was really hard to tell what was going on. So I might try it again in trade when I'm reading a bunch of Valiant trades together, perhaps. Um, 
but reading it standing alone, I think is, is just not going to work for me. So I have this pretty to look at issue. Um, although if <laughs> part of switching to my new comic book store is that it's very small and does not carry a lot of comics so that I would be less tempted to pick things up. If I were going to my old shop, I might have and might end up being tempted to buy 4001 issue two. Um, and the same thing would be true with House of Penance. If, if they had it at my shop, I probably would have got it, even though it's, I don't need this comic. Because I'm not, I'm not really into the story. I don't really care about the characters. Um, I don't care. A, I can go without knowing what happens next. Let's put it that way. But I love the artwork. And I love the general kind of Edgar Allan Poe-ish weirdness of this this woman who I think feels guilty for her um, her husband's fortune, who, her husband who's now dead, fortune made with the Winchester rifles. And uh, I don't know where it's going, but I think I would have picked up issue two if it was sitting there in my comic book store, but I didn't get excited enough to tell my new shop to put it on my pull list. However, um, on Memorial Day, there will be a big sale at another comic book shop, which tends to stock um, the indie books pretty deeply. So I might pick up issue two there then. Because um, I, I really love this artwork. This is The artwork is, uh, the script is by Peter J. Tomasi, but it's nothing like his DC work. The artwork is by Ian Bertram, who did an issue, I've read an issue of of Zero that he drew, the one about um, William S. Burroughs, and then he did one bizarre issue of Batman Eternal that most Batman readers hated, um, and I don't blame them because of the art change, but he is he's perfect for this kind of psycho nightmare kind of uh, story. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing more of his artwork. I probably, if I don't pick this up in issues, I didn't even notice this back cover before. That is really cool. I'll probably pick this up in issues, but if I don't get the rest, I'm sure I will I will buy it digitally or buy it in trade. I, I tend to buy a lot of Dark Horse comics digitally. I'm not sure why that is. And another one that I thought was interesting but didn't super click with me was this issue of Spawn. I was loving the um, Spawn in Hell saga, Chronicle, whatever it was called, of the last four or five issues, um, which is what I picked Spawn up for. Well, I picked Spawn up because of the team-up of Eric Larson and Todd McFarland, and I, I loved their little thing in Hell. It was a visual delight, and it was kind of just goofy fun too uh in the last issue god showed up and he of course was this big giant muscular man with a giant white beard and everything it was really cool <laughs> uh now spawns back on earth he doesn't have his costume at least not yet um he's kind of doing stupid things and getting himself into trouble but he supposedly has this plan to s to protect people and save people. He's having weird nightmares. Um, there's a lot more writing in this issue and the conversations and such, they're okay. You know, it's not Neil Adams bad or anything like that, um, but they're kind of dull to read. And um, there's no they don't have the writerly rhythms or whatever. And, and they, the writing was much more inspired in, in hell than it is here in the real world. But I will, I will keep picking this up. I want to see what happens next. And I, I have it on my pull list. It's two ninety nine. I really enjoy seeing what this uh, art and writing team does together. I understand that Eric Larson, because I heard an interview with Todd McFarland about this, Eric Larson, they're coming up with the plot together. Eric Larson is um, doing very rough, loose pencils, and then McFarland is inking them and adding his McFarland sexy, as he calls it, to them. 
Um, yeah, I, for those of you who find that sexy, uh, you're in you're in luck. There's lots of McFarland sexy on here. Um, but, and then I'm not sure who writes the dialogue. I wonder if that varies by issue or something. I don't think he discussed who writes the dialogue. But, so that was my main problem with this issue, was kind of the dialogue and the pacing of things. Another one that won't just show up in my small little shop is Four Kids Walk Into a Bank. I think I picked this up at uh, Things From Another World um, on Free Comic Book Day. And I liked it, but it, it didn't excite me. Um, it had little touches that are kind of like older indie comics, you know, like a, um, oh, I forget the name of that guy. Anyway, you know, with the talking heads and the repeating panels and stuff, um, which is kind of fun, but overall the story felt felt unsurprising. Um, I definitely felt like I could wait for the trade. I and I may or may not want to read it in the trade. But again, if there had been if issue two had been laying around my comic book shop, I probably would have picked it up. It's a fun, it's a fun, cool little read. It just didn't set a spark under me. Saints, I think, has only one more issue to go. Or is it going to go for 12 issues? Anyway, uh, I'm loving the art, still kind of hating the coloring. Although I've gotten, I've kind of come to terms with this murkier coloring. Um, and there's a lot of, there's the big battle between the Saints and the church or some televangelist who uh, wants to bring about the coming of the Antichrist so that we can have, you know, the, uh, the end of the world and Judgment Day and everything. Um, why, why they think after they've uh, brought about the Antichrist that they're going to go to heaven, uh, no logic to that. Anyway, there's tons of cool stuff in here, but I think because maybe this series is being done in a more quickly than they originally meant to, there's cer it feels like certain details are left out or it's hard to keep track of who all the characters are. Maybe that's also just a flaw of, I think it's the first time this team has done a comic book or this writer has done a comic book, so there might be a little disconnect there. But it's still a lot of fun, and uh, hopefully these guys will do more comics and I will buy them. Um, so yeah, Saints is a, is a cool comic. Get another colorist. <laughs> okay, so now I'm getting to Blubber. These... For whatever reason, my tiny new comic book shop did have just sitting on the shelf. And I love these covers. I'm a Gilbert Hernandez fan, but I try to usually get his stuff in trade. But I, but it was like, oh, there aren't very many new comics here that I can just pick up that I didn't have on my pull. So I grabbed these. And so, like I say, this is not safe for public consumption. Um... It starts out, you know, with some made-up animals jerking off and pooping and eating each other. And I thought, oh, this is going to be kind of fun as we explore Gilbert Hernandez's crazy made-up creatures. And then, you know, more sexual stuff starts popping in. Um, we have a lot of creatures giving each other... Um, oral sex, raping each other, raping in the eye, raping in orifices. Um, but then there was some other fun stuff. So um, it was kind of cool, just all these made up creatures. Um, so there was just a little, you know, there was just here and there this sexual stuff. And I'm like, a part of me is like, okay, cool. This is like an underground comic. Here's some bizarre penis for you to see. Um, I can go with that. My only problem is this This was sitting <laughs> about waist level on a rack, unwrapped up in a comic book store that I take my daughter into. Um, so that's a little not cool. Then the next issue, um, the uh, 
over the top rapey sexy sex stuff continued and now there's there's humans in the mix um and there's okay so this is really not for work there's um sex with this childlike looking creature um so at this point i just don't know what to think i mean i'm this normally a hernandez fan I read an interview with him where he said, you know, he wanted, he felt alternative comics were getting less edgy now, and he wanted to bring some edginess back with uh, with Blubber. And I'm all for kind of exploring the bizarre areas of your psyche and stuff. I guess it's just the... It felt better to me back when underground comics you had to buy in an underground kind of place. You know, like a, a, when I first bought some underground comics uh, in the very early 80s when they still had head shops, it was like in the back of the head shop in this area with a blue light and a, a beads over a little alcove. And inside the alcove were these dirty comics, um, which were not nearly as dirty as this. And so I guess I, you know, maybe it's me being old and conservative. <laughs> I'm not too conservative to kind of look at comics like this. I do kind of a little shocked that Hernandez wants to focus so much on on the more rapey side of things. Sometimes it is funny, like, um, well, I'm looking at this thing, but maybe you don't want to look at it, where a guy had a zombie penis up his patootie, and it broke off inside of him, and now he's trying to get his other friend to suck it out of him, but his friend won't do it. <laughs> you know, so there is funny stuff there on that level. Um, but it's, you know, it's very... Um, what's the word? Not sacrilegious. very... Um, outside of the boundaries. Um can't think of the right word for it it's late at night now um <clears throat> but anyway so I, I don't know if i'll seek out issue three i probably will but i just i wish these were in some kind of space where you knew this is the space of underground stuff or adult stuff i think you know it's inevitable when you have adult stuff that teenagers and maybe even preteens might stumble across it and and of course be highly motivated to look at it but at least they know they know they're looking at something that is is off bounds they understand that it's not uh appropriate um if my daughter picked up one of these comics at her age you know, anything the adults do is supposed to be appropriate. It's supposed to be um, approved. Um, so for her to think that this kind of stuff in here is something that um, is approved of by adults and is a good thing, you know, I don't, good thing is the wrong word, but you know what I mean? She just, it, I don't know what, I, I have to hide these for one thing. Um, and yeah. If it were any, if it was more realistic, I would certainly not want to read it because I don't particularly like being grossed out, um, and I'm certainly not in any way a fan of rape fantasies, uh, even with zombies with detachable penises. <laughs> I like saying that though. Okay, so this is probably the most adult stuff I have actually shown on screen. I I hope I have not offended anyone by doing that. Um, so I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.